As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. The next reading is from John 11, uh, verses 28 through 34. And I'm not sure where that is in the Pew Bible. I'm reading from the large print version, as you can see. John 11, 28 through 34. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When, Jew, when the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Our final reading is John 12, verses 1 through 8. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why hasn't the, this perfume been sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. The word of the Lord. Thank you, Alan. I don't know if we've ever done three passages before, but first for everything. Good to see all of you. Welcome, welcome. So we're in our series uh, today, Women in the Kingdom, and we are looking at Mary and Martha and kind of their story, some snapshots that we see of their lives throughout the scripture. Uh, and so just kind of a big picture look at this series, right? So today we're looking at Mary and Martha. Next week we're doing Easter on the Westford Common. Monica's talking about Mary Magdalene. And then the week following that, I'm going to take some of those hard texts from the Bible about women. First Timothy chapter 2. And the following will be Galatians. And then we're going to look at First Peter. Uh, and I had written one giant sermon in 1 Timothy 2, nine pages, but we decided, you know what, we shouldn't do that all at once. So we're going to split that up uh, and be looking at different passages uh, for the weeks following. So that's kind of where we're headed. Uh, but today we're going to slow down, because I realized, like, I, I was like, we don't want to talk about 1 Timothy 2 on Palm Sunday. That would be really weird. Uh, so we're going to just look at Mary and Martha and hear from the Lord as we sort of head towards Easter, as we head towards the cross. Because uh, I think that's where this, this text takes us on a journey, getting ready for Easter. So let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for Martha and Mary, who lived so long ago, were real women, uh, with real gifts, real callings, uh, real struggles, real humanity, uh, and that they can lead us, point us to Jesus. They experienced you, Jesus, and we get to experience you along with them. 
Thank you for the ways that they have blessed millions of people. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I wanted to think about just like Mary and Martha, right? The, like their lives, their stories. And we started with kind of the, 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 the typical story, right, of Martha serving in the kitchen. And I want us to think about that, to imagine, to use your imagination. Go to your home, your kitchen, right? Martha is working. She is, like, dicing the carrots. She's preparing the dinner. She's washing the salad. She is cooking the roast beef. The, the aroma of the food is beginning to fill the home. And yet, she's also anxious because she has some very important guests in the home. She has a very famous rabbi, Rabbi Jesus, who is traveling the country, healing people, performing miracles, casting out demons, and he has come to her home. She wants to, like, she recognizes, like, this is a significant figure. I want to do the best I can to serve him. So she's, like, pulling out the china, right? Like, doesn't get used very often, but she is using it this day. And yet... You know, there's sweat, there's anxiety, things aren't coming together, she's worried the roast is going to burn, and she's looking around and saying, like, where's all of my help? (laughs) Where's the team? Where's my sister Mary, who usually helps me with these kinds of things, whose job it is to help me? Maybe she looks around the corner, I don't know if there was a multi-room house or how this worked, but looks around the corner sees Jesus, Rabbi Jesus, sitting in the, like, the big leather recliner, like, comfy, like, the place of honor in the house. Ours is, like, a rocking chair or the glider. That would be our, our place of honor. She, she sees his disciples seated on, like, the sectional, like, all 12, just packed in, like, one <laughs> after the other. Some of them are seated on the floor. And then she looks over, and she sees... Gasp, her sister, Mary, sitting at the feet of Jesus, curled up, just like a look of awe on her face, listening so intent to whatever Jesus says, and instead of being excited for Mary, she is just frustrated, because that's not her job. That's not her role. She should be in the kitchen. She should be helping prepare the meal for Jesus. Instead, Mary's acting like one of those disciples. She's just taking a position of learning. She's acting like one of the men. And this frustrates Martha. And so she move, maneuvers into the room. She, she comes elegantly flowing into Jesus. And yet there is just like a bite in her voice. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus, are you aware of what my Sister has done. She has left me to do all the work by myself. Tell her to help me. <laughs> Mary, like, looks up and is like, oh, oh no. A little shock in her face. And then Martha makes eye contact with Jesus. And just like, you know, when someone like looks past your eyes, face into like your soul. (laughs) I bet there was a moment there where Jesus saw the true Martha. He speaks to her. He actually speaks words of life. Martha, Martha. It's a way of saying, I love you. I know you. I care about you, Martha. We have a relationship. You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better. It will not be taken away from her. You ever like let air out of a balloon? Just kind of like squeaks and it's deflated and it's not as fun anymore. I feel like that was probably what happened to Martha. She deflates with like a little squeak. By all outward appearances, by all cultural expectations, by all of society's expectations, Martha was right. She was also wrong. (laughs) Jesus first just calls us to come and be with him. To come and sit in his presence. 
Jesus does not say to Martha, shame on you for serving me. He does not say that. We just challenge her. You know, knowing me, being in my presence, sitting at my feet, that is what's better. Being my disciple. Even if it's not what the world expects, even if it's not what gets the job done. Come to me. Jesus calls us in just the way we need to hear. How is he calling you? What's he saying to you? Are you so busy, anxious, wrapped up in what the world has to offer that's hard to just even hear Christ? To hear his calling? Come and sit at the feet of Jesus. What expectations do you feel the world is placing on you or culture? Are you placing on yourself? Are you placing on others? How might Jesus want to break in with his expectations, with his calling, what he asks us to do? Just often different than what we ask ourselves to do or what others ask us to do. That's sort of scene one. That's Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. Let's shift to John chapter 11, 28 through 34. Mary is crying. Mary is not just like, oh, boo-hoo, I am sad. Mary is weeping. Tears are rolling down her face. Her gut aches. She is gasping for breath. It comes. She breathes. But then she remembers why she's crying, and she starts crying again because her brother Lazarus has died. She remembers Lazarus and how much she loved him, how they grew up together, playing together, sharing life experiences together. Her, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, three peas in a pod. And now, for whatever reason, God has taken her brother. Her brother has died and the tears come and she's just like crying herself dry. Several minutes before, Mary had just seen kind of out of the corner of her eye, her sister Martha Someone came in and whispered in their home to her ear, and Martha got up and left. She knows, she has some idea, she has some impression of what this might be, that the rabbi has finally arrived. The rabbi has finally come to Bethany. The rabbi they love and respect and admire, who they sent for multiple days prior, has finally arrived. They had sent word to their rabbi, to Jesus, to someone who they knew cared about their family because they knew he could heal the sick. He could perform miracles. And their brother Lazarus was on his deathbed, and they knew that Jesus cared about Lazarus. He'd come to their home. This was like a family friend. You expect your friend to show up. And yet, nothing. Nothing for days. It was clear that Jesus was not coming. The rabbi actually heard the word, he heard the message, and then he stayed for two days. I think his disciples were probably relieved because he would have had to go near to Jerusalem, and things were becoming tense. When he finally did decide to go, one of his disciples said, okay, let's go so we can die with Lazarus too, because that's how dangerous the situation is. It's risky. But they'd still thought, like, Jesus can perform miracles. Maybe he can come at night. Maybe he can come as quickly as possible and heal our brother. He just doesn't come. And this is especially painful for Mary because Jesus had made her feel loved, respected. He had welcomed her to sit at his feet. Things hurt the most, right, when those that we love or we think they love us, they betray us, right? You can only imagine what Mar- Mary must have been feeling, and Martha too. But then sometime later, Martha comes back in. Mary's still sitting there mourning, surrounded by mourners, rocking silently in tears. Mary, Martha just whispers to Mary, the teacher is here, Martha, or Mary. He is asking for you. Sometimes God speaks 
through our siblings, through those we love. And when Mary heard the call of her rabbi, she knew she had to go. My rabbi is calling me. Let's do this. Let's go. So she picked herself up, broken heart and all, and walked out the door. Her mourners thought that she was going to the tomb, and so they they got up and they followed her. This big crowd was forming behind her. Mary comes to Jesus. She does what she is most familiar with. She falls at his feet. She comes to the exact same place she had been at before. The first time that she had come to the feet of Jesus and sat, she had learned, she had listened, she had grown. She was one of his disciples. But this time when she comes to Jesus' feet, she is overwhelmed with grief, with anxious, anxious, uh, with anxiety, with loss. And yet she still comes. And it's so tempting to only come to the feet of Jesus when things are going well. (laughs) When the world is as it should be. But we also have to come to the feet of Jesus when those we love have died. When we're walking through the dark valley. When we're experiencing loss and sorrow. We come to the feet of Jesus at either day and Mary comes and she says, Uh, To Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Ah, she just gets to the point. (laughs) If you had been here, I wouldn't be crying like this. Lazarus, my brother, would be alive. Mary sort of charges Jesus. Man, Mary is just breaking out of all cultural expectations. Just like confronting the rabbi to his face. There's a lot we can learn from Mary and her relationship with Jesus. How, how, how might we come to God, to Jesus, when we're disappointed, when sorrow overtakes us? And just lay it out there. God, I am disappointed. I, Jesus, I am disappointed that this is how this went. Now, just moments before, Mary didn't know this, but Martha and Jesus had a conversation where Jesus had pretty much said, like, your brother will rise again. And and Martha had said, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Martha is a woman of faith. She believes in the promises of God. But Jesus, listen, listen to how Jesus answered. But Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Clearly Martha did because she went and got her sister. (laughs) Something's about to go down. You're going to want to see this. (laughs) Everyone's pulling out their smartphone and just like hitting record. (laughs) Do you believe this? Do you believe that Jesus can raise the dead? Do you believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? Maybe you've lost someone recently. I have. It it, it makes us pause, doesn't it? And reassess, do I actually believe Jesus is the resurrection and the life? Yes, I do. And I hope you do too. They come to the tomb. And it actually says, like, Jesus, when he sees Mary weeping, is so deeply moved that he asks, where have you laid him? And then Jesus says, take away the stone. And it says, like, when Jesus saw Mary weeping, like, he began to weep. He was deeply moved in spirit. Like he got angry, he got angry at death, got upset. Jesus cares about what we go through. Jesus cares when we lose someone, when, when we feel the sting of death. He's, I, think he, I think he's sad. But like, of all the people, he's someone who can solve it. 
Martha's sort of horrified when Jesus says, take away the stone. Because you're like, you didn't show up before, now you're going to desecrate his body? Yes, Jesus is going to desecrate Lazarus' body with life. (laughs) Which is absolutely eternal life. He says, Lazarus, come out. And then, like, Lazarus stumbles out, wrapped in cloths, burial cloths. Take it off him. Baby-like new skin. And that's when, like, sorrow turns to joy. That's when grief turns to happiness. That's what we're going to experience when we see Jesus, or when Jesus comes back, and we're reunited with those we love, who know Christ, too. But we shift one more time in the story. We shift to John chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Jesus has come once again to the home of Lazarus, of Martha, and Mary. And here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. (laughs) Martha's doing her thing. She has prepared it. She's serving it. She doesn't get, like, called out. She's doing her thing. This is how God has gifted and called her. Do it. Serve. I think Mary's probably sitting at the feet of Jesus, and Martha's like, oh, there she goes again. At some point, Mary must slip out, go get something that is precious to her, is extravagant. She comes back in. And this time she's carrying a little alabaster jar or a flask. Alabaster is like this very soft white mineral that you can carve and make a little like jar for ointment. And once again, where does she come? She comes to the feet of Jesus. Like the feet are like this place of dirt and filth and humility. Right When Jesus wanted to express service to his disciples and show them how low they should go in serving others, what did he do? He washed their feet. And, and maybe he got the idea from Mary, I don't know. She comes in and she kneels at his feet and she anoints his feet with this costly perfume, this nard, and it begins to fill the whole home with the smell of this perfume. It's like walking into Sephora. And it's just like, whoa, hits you. (laughs) And I think, I imagine there was like this hush in the room. And the only one who looked comfortable was Jesus. (laughs) And this, 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 this nard is expensive. This is a year's salary. Your salary for a year. One act of devotion. Would you do it? Mary does it. And in this act, she is doing something that mimics the prophets of old. When God chose Samuel, or when God used Samuel the prophet to choose King Saul to be king, he anointed him. He chose David to be king, he anointed him. Messiah means anointed one. Christ means Messiah means anointed one. So whenever you say Jesus the Christ, you're saying Jesus the anointed one. Mary did it first. Mary anointed Jesus. Now Jesus says, leave her alone, because Judas pipes up. It's like, why didn't this money get sold for the poor, or to give to the poor? Jesus says, leave her alone. This perfume is for my burial. It's another message. Jesus is saying, like, this is an act of devotion. She is preparing my body for its funeral. And at the same time, like, she's not only preparing him for death, I don't know if she even grasped what she was doing, but she's like anointing him. And remember, Jesus is king, Jesus is Lord, but Jesus is Lord over death. As he heads towards the cross, as he dies and he rises again, he is the victor over death. Radically redefining what it means to be prepared for burial. And we don't know what happens in the rest of the story to Mary and Martha. Jesus is honored. You know, uh, the medieval legend goes that Martha, uh, well, Mary becomes like this traveling gospel preacher, and Martha goes with her, and Martha, like, defeats a dragon. Everything is awesome in the, the Middle Ages, I guess, in terms of lore. But it's clear that God 
worked in both of these women. He affirmed their callings. Their callings were different. Martha called to serve. Mary called to be a learner, to be a disciple. And even as she anoints Jesus, she is embodying the gospel message. She's proclaiming it. And so we're going to go to our small groups in here in just a minute. We're going to talk about these figures. We're going to see, like, what, what are you here in this moment? How is God moving in you? How do you need to come to the feet of Jesus like Mary? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this message. Thank you for Martha. Thank you for Mary. Help us to hear and apply their stories and to just be drawn into worship, to come to the feet of Jesus. I pray that as we break into these groups that we would genuinely come to the feet of Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.